All right. Um, so let's, uh, let's begin with a prayer, actually. Uh, please pray with me. God of grace and God of glory, on your people pour your power. You who sang your church's story, give us strength again to flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. For the facing of this hour. Amen. Uh, so I'm not sure how many of you know this, but I'm pretty sure Heather is kind of tired of hearing about it. Uh, but the summer after I graduated from college, I sold vegetables at a roadside stand. Yeah, uh, see? Uh -huh. Uh, in the suburbs of Minneapolis, Minnesota. I would get up pretty early in the morning and drive to the farm and then climb into a pickup truck that was loaded and then go to a stand maybe in Golden Valley, maybe in Woodbury, once or twice even in my native Eden Prairie, and lay out vegetables on trays and then make sure they're neatly arranged and then dump big bags of uh, corn, sweet corn, uh, still in the husk, out onto other big trays and then you cover the corn with ice and you put wet burlap sacks on it because you want to keep it fresh because the freshness of the corn was a key advantage for these roadside stands. The corn was picked that day. And there were people who would come up to us to buy corn, and they could tell which was picked that day and which was maybe some that we had left over from the day before. And when they could tell, they wanted today's corn, right? And as part of my training, I knew this because I had gone down to the farm, farm one day, even earlier, about 6 in the morning, to go out with the pickers and to see the machines harvesting and see the people sorting the ears out. And then stack it, you had to stack them into a bag. You had to put 48 ears of corn into a burlap sack for the sellers to take later and sell. And what I want to tell you about all this, the point of this, is that the best land, the very best land for growing a heavy feeder like corn, was the land that was down along the banks of the Minnesota River. And I still remember driving in the dark through some of that bottom land with the farmer explaining how this was one of his best fields. And the reason the land by the river is the best farmland, you might know already, is because it floods the most. And when the waters recede, they leave behind a rich layer of fertility, a layer of silty, thick dirt, the kind of material that makes for the best kind of soil in the world. Now, in some ways, Paul, or Saul, as he's called in our story today, has an overwhelming experience that we could compare to a flood. At the start of the story, he has a pretty strong house of faith that he has certainly built up and filled with the furniture that he likes. You know, a little bit of threats and murder here in this corner, and over here on the floor, there's appreciation from the authorities that he respects, plus up on the wall, some respect and recognition, uh, and naturally uh, in the bathroom, uh, on the, in, in the mirror, there's um, an image of God who uh, wants him to do what he's doing. But on the road, Jesus makes himself known the waters rise, and everything that Saul had built is washed away. And then, in a way, for three days, he's in a kind of a tomb. He doesn't eat, he doesn't say much, and he can't see. He just prays and he waits, alone, in a way, with that startling vision, that voice from the Lord, an authority that he had been actively and violently fighting against up until that moment. So one of my reactions in going to our old place and carrying things out to be cleaned uh, had to do with forgetting to bring gloves. Um, and on that Thursday, I kept having this feeling of washing, wanting to wash my hands again and again, right? Like I was like, oh, it, it felt like they're never going to be clean again. Um, and I, they didn't really get that much dirt on them, just a little bit. And on the one hand, there is some basis for this. As Heather was saying, um, the mud that comes up in a flood, especially in the middle of a city, <clears throat> is very likely to carry nasty things with it. Chemicals, bacteria, and we definitely use bleach to clean up, for sure. But there was something more. Uh, the dirt that I was imagining on my hands, the contamination that wouldn't wash, wash off, um, as I reflected on it, it felt like it was sorrow, like destruction, like a coating of death. The loss and the sadness were clinging to my hands as much as any actual mud. But here's the thing. The flood and the mud it leaves behind are destructive. But at the same time, the places that 
experience flooding the most are the ones that are the most fertile, with the most possibility for new life, for new growth, for producing the healthiest, most delicious food. So while I'm glad today to literally be worshiping on high ground, in another li less literal way, I don't want us to get out of the floodplain. Change comes and takes away what we've built, but it leaves it behind a rich and fertile material for making something new. At the end of his three days, in a kind of tomb, Saul is awakened by a brave member of what will become Saul's new community. Ananias lays on hands, and the scales on Saul's eyes fall away. He will see the world differently from now on. And the next thing he does to return to life is to be baptized as a Christian and then have something to eat, which I don't think is an incidental side note. In a few moments, we'll be celebrating communion together. And there are a few things I'd like to remember as we eat together. One is that communion is a sacrament. It's a tangible experience of God's presence. And, that has important under and one that has important undertones for healing, even in the face of loss. Second, the communion reminds us that the church is the gathered body of Christ, the people not the building where we meet, or the stuff we use for worship. Worship itself is not even church, even though it's easy to think of it that way. The people make up the church, and we are connected to the larger body of Christ, the universal church, when we eat this meal together. Finally, the Eucharist that Jesus celebrated with his disciples was an adaptation of the Jewish Passover meal. And the Passover is a meal that commemorates the Israelites' escape from Egypt and the beginning of their 40 years living as nomads in the desert, relying on God to provide bread from heaven every day. In the midst of wandering, in the midst of moving, of being ready to pull up stakes and just go, may God provide for us always. And our, may our faith in each other grow, and may our faith grow in God as we see together the Spirit's ability to make a new way out of no way. In the name of our brother Jesus, who had no place to lay his head. Amen. So let's have some time for silence and reflection. And I don't know why I'm taking the mic off. It just records what I'm saying. It's not doing it. And then our community conversation question is, how have, people been, how have other people been a part of your spiritual growth or awakening? How have uh, groups or um, individuals been part of your spiritual growth or awakening?